Kamala Harris, uh, she has announced that she will be running in 2020. Kamala Harris, of course, is a Democratic senator, and she does have a bit of a mixed record. But before we get to that, uh, let me just say that she does identify as a progressive. There has been a lot of controversy surrounding that label, especially in regard to Kamala Harris's past career as a prosecutor. So we're gonna give you the details on that. But let me give you her statements. She served as San Francisco's district attorney and California attorney general before being elected to the Senate back in 2016. And she will highlight her career as a prosecutor with the campaign slogan for the people. Now that is, Definitely different from what we saw with Hillary Clinton's campaign. She had the slogan, I'm with her. Mm -hmm. So it was more about her, whereas Kamala Harris wants to focus more on running a campaign for the people. Right, that is good messaging. It is clear, it is ambiguous of course, but not in the same way that I'm with her was. I'm with her when I went back at the end of the Hillary Clinton campaign and asked myself what was her message, there was like, forward together whatever they had i that which was two words together i didn't mean anything to me but the i'm with her simply just said i am a woman and that wasn't enough for the people it does sound like if obama's was hope for the people is a good uh intentionally populist message right. and as we'll discover I, i'm sure like the conscious uh pivoting that kamala has done toward populism in the last few years Absolutely, yeah. yeah, exactly. And and she has really tried to make herself appear to be progressive. I think she especially noticed the popularity of progressive policies during the past election. And so, um, you know, her history as a prosecutor was certainly not as progressive as some would like to see. But um, her campaign does include some ideas, some uh, policy proposals that are Liberal. So uh, her campaign platform includes a monthly tax credit of as much as $500 for families earning less than $100,000 a year, reducing maternal mortality rates and bail overhauls to reduce the federal prison population. Now, uh, with that said, I do want to go to um, some video of Kamala Harris uh, announcing. Let's take a look at that. Truth, justice, decency, equality. Freedom, democracy, these aren't just words. They're the values we as Americans cherish, and they're all on the line now. The future of our country depends on you and millions of others lifting our voices to fight for our American values. That's why I'm running for President of the United States. I'm running to lift those voices, to bring our voices together. So please join me in Oakland on Sunday, January 27th, and go to KamalaHarris.org to join our campaign. Let's do this together. Let's claim our future for ourselves, for our children, and for our country. I'll see you in Oakland. So that was the announcement video that she posted on Twitter. What are your thoughts on that, Brett? The, as Edwin also pointed out during it, uh, that is the damage report theme song, more or less. Boom, da, boom, boom, right, da, boom, right, boom, right, right. It is the, uh, I wanna say it's the, what is it? Oh, Mickey, you're so fine, and yes. the My Sharona mix, <laughs> um, which John would not allow to be said on the <laughs> show uh, if he were here. But it's true, it's true. Yeah. Uh, what'd you think of it? I, it came across as a little, uh, I'm gonna be honest, it came across as a little cheesy for me, for my taste, yeah. uh, but it, it was fine, it was okay. Uh, I think that what's more important is focusing on what you're gonna do, how you're going to move the country in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And I get it, this is the first announcement video that she put out, so it's not gonna get into the nitty gritty of all of that. But when I watch that, I, it just does message to me that, this is standard political announcement stuff. The non-standard thing to me that jumps out the most is her color palette. Her color palette mm -hmm. is not red, white, and blue, mm -hmm. which is like the main decision that a lot of uh, candidates make when they run for president is should we be like the background be blue, should the background be red, or should the background be white? But in this situation, it does have red, white, and blue, but it also has yellow, it also has purple, I think. It has a lot of different colors to kind of 
bring together the for the people, I don't know, the like, there are many colors to people in America. And, yeah. and it shows it visually throughout the, the message. Well, I like that you mentioned color because, well, first off, she announced on MLK Day, mm -hmm. um, and that was certainly a statement. Also, her campaign colors, red and yellow, are borrowed from the 1972 campaign of uh, Shirley Chrisholm. Uh, that was the first black woman to seek the presidency. So uh, maybe the use of color there was intentional. But her campaign colors do harken back to uh, you know other figures who made history uh, yeah. for being people of color and for uh, pushing for political change. Now let's talk a little bit about her prosecutorial record because that really does stand out to me as a progressive, someone who sees mass incarceration as a huge issue. Now after she announced, she made statements uh, like this. Uh, right now we have an administration that has waged a full on assault against Afri uh, American institutions and American ideals. It is going to be about speaking truth, especially when there's so much that is contrary to truth. It is going to be about regaining the trust of Americans. So she does make a statement about Trump and then moves on to excessive policing here in the US. I will say that there is a lot about what I did as a prosecutor that I'm proud of, including a recognition that there are fundamental flaws in the criminal justice system and that this criminal justice system needs to be reformed. She also says, it is a false choice to suggest that communities don't want law enforcement, most communities do. They don't want excessive force. They don't want racial profiling, but nobody should. Now, those statements I agree with. I think most progressives agree with. But then when you look at her record, it certainly goes against those statements. Okay, so before I get to it, jump in, Brett. Um, right. And the thing that's going to be difficult, and as soon as you get into nuance, you find that it gets obviously complicated, but she has a history of being a district attorney mm -hmm. and being an attorney general of state. And in that, there there are decisions that those individuals have to make to both set the agenda of prosecution, but also keep an eye on how that relates to what the laws actually are right now. So there's both, okay, here is what I choose to go forward with prosecutions on and not emphasize in terms of prosecutions. And that can kind of lay down, but it's not as sweeping as one would be able to get away with if they were president. Right, you know? yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, and, and for me, what I found a little shocking about her record was her inability to accept, you know, certain damning evidence against the prosecution side. Um, and how she pushed for convictions when it wasn't the right thing to do. So I'll give you just a quick example. In 2015, she opposed a bill requiring her office to investigate shootings involving officers. And she refused to support statewide standards regulating the use of body worn cameras by police officers. That was in 2015, that was not 25 years ago, that wasn't 10 years ago. It was very recent where she believed that it didn't make sense to go after officer involved shootings. Now this is all according to Laura Bazelon. She wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. I fact checked all of the, the claims that she made about Senator Harris. And she's right, these are all very controversial issues. One other quick thing, um, Harris fought tooth and nail to uphold wrongful convictions that had been secured through official misconduct that included evidence tampering, false testimony, and the suppression of crucial information by prosecutors. Mm -hmm. So these are all problematic to say the least, and these are issues that she will have to answer to um, as this election moves forward. But she has pivoted toward a more progressive, um, presentation of these issues since then. And there are people in this category. It mm -hmm. will be Cory Booker, it will, be, it is the Chris and Jill brand. It is the individuals who see the writing on the wall, see that the, you know, learn lessons from 2016 and have essentially told themselves, I need to move left. And we can claim credit for that. Like yeah. that is a mission, that is part of the mission accomplished. It still needs to happen. And the next part of that is to hold these people accountable for these, because there's ambiguity as to whether they have taken these stances just because they're under pressure to and they kind of have to check that box. Right. Or are they gonna follow through on it and that's us 
That's on us to put the pressure on them to continue to do that. It's a great point. But I want to continue the conversation because there is some criticism regarding her prosecutorial record. Is she as progressive as she presents herself to be? Now, in a New York Times op ed, Laura Bazelon writes that Harris defended Johnny Baca's conviction for murder, even though judges found a prosecutor presented false testimony at the trial. She relented only after a video of the oral argument received national attention and embarrassed her office. Office. Now, Bazelon continues to write that Harris was criticized in 2010 for withholding information about a police laboratory technician who had been accused of intentionally sabotaging her work and stealing drugs from the lab. After a memo surfaced showing that Harris's deputies knew about the technician's wrongdoing and recent conviction, but failed to alert defense attorneys, a judge condemned Harris's indifference to the systemic violation of the defendant's constitutional rights. There's more. I highly recommend everybody read this op-ed in the New York Times. And there are several references with links that you can click on to see the full context of the claims made against her. But this is very important, especially considering where we are in the country right now when it comes to police using excessive force, when it comes to prosecutors either tampering with evidence or withholding evidence that would prove the innocence of a defendant. This is something that we talk about on the Young Turks on a regular basis. It's part of the problem that we're seeing in our justice system. And I'm curious if this is something that will resonate with the majority of Democratic voters or if it's something that wonky people like us pay attention to and no one else does. When you look at the polling about potential people running, there is this like, only people who have run for president before seem to have that name recognition. So everyone that we think mm-hmm. is a front run, a potential front runner, some potential to break through, does not have that level of support yet. So there's a lot that goes into it. 538 actually has a pretty good rundown of how like the schedule mm-hmm. of primaries, how it's changed lately, can factor into her potential rise because uh, essentially, and this is gonna sound super identity politics, but like South Carolina is super early. South Carolina, the black vote like that really kind of ruined Bernie and went to Hillary, that is very important. So you're gonna have uh, the, a bunch of people, are gonna have Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker fighting for that vote. And if Kamala is able to rise above and get the kind of notoriety that she was able to get during the Kavanaugh hearing, that Booker tried to get, but there was just something about him that wasn't yeah. real natural. It he's seemed a, like he was pandering. He's oh. a duck. Yes. He's a duck. And the turn and he's a Stanford grad. And I'm sorry, Corey, you did catch the touchdown pass against Cal. Good for you. But <laughs> I do think that he's a bit of a duck, which is like when you see a duck on top of the surface, they seem real mellow, mm. but right below the surface, they're like flailing like crazy. That's what I get from Cory Booker when he tries to nail it the way that Kamala, as a prosecutor, really is in her element doing, which lends itself to the potential to rise above the rest of the group during a debate, because that's kind of her element. Right, that is kind of her element. And and I, I am glad that you mentioned the way she grilled Kavanaugh during those hearings, because that was something that really stood out to me. Look, all of these candidates are mixed bags. They're humans, we're all mixed bags. So. You know, no one's perfect. Everyone's going to have something in their record that makes us uncomfortable. And her record as a prosecutor makes me uncomfortable. But with that said, you also have to think about the long game and who would be best suited in a matchup against Trump. And we need. We need candidates who know how to fight him effectively. And I think that she would score in that department. I think she knows how to fight, she knows how to do it effectively. And, um, you know, I, I want that. I want that in a candidate, someone who's willing to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and again, effectively, that's the important word here, because I think you, we have seen people on the left try to fight Trump, and they've failed at doing so. You know, Elizabeth Warren, as much as I like her as a candidate, the way that she handled the Native American yeah. situation was not, was not effective. It wasn't good. Um, and he actually ended up using it against her. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how this all plays and, out. And there is a, there is a, way that sexism colors someone's perception of women in political office. And I think the kind of like sexism on the ground runs against Elizabeth Warren in a way that I think it could favor Kamala Harris. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, Elizabeth Warren 
She's a fighter as well, but in terms of optics, I think that she seems a little more meek compared to Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. And a little more traditional in her presentation, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whereas Kamala Harris is, is more willing to get aggressive and fight. I don't know if that makes any sense. And this isn't a way to pit the two of them against no, each other. No, this is all. a way to kind of look at something that was very evident in the 2016 election, which is the role of sexism, the way a, a politician is viewed and their potential. Um, hopefully this will all revolve, as you've been putting it, um, around their policies, yes. around what they stand for, and etc. Thank you very much for watching this clip from The Damage Report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.